Shut up and sit down. Hello, my name is Holly. Welcome to the Murder She Shed. Come on in. You will make me have a big old grin, and I will tell you true crime with a crazy spin. Either way, it's a win-win. Now, it's time for you to do your job and hit that like and subscribe. First, because you like me, right? Maybe. Do it anyway. Help a Southern girl out. And then the subscribe because you can get all my true crime content. And it's usually cases that you might not see anywhere else. So make sure you do that. I gave you all the time in the world to do it. You should have done it by now. All right, here we go. A cold case was just solved. But is it the work of a serial killer? We will be linking several crimes to this one murder just on the sedation in similar ways in which the man killed his victims. Authorities are currently testing DNA on some of these cases we're going to mention in order to prove whether Jack Boken was a serial killer. If you guys heard of Jack Boken, me either, but when I looked him up and found out his history, I was like, wow. I'm going to take you back and I'm going to tell you his history and then we're going to tie it all in to Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders. Have you guys heard of those? I'm sure you have. Well, he could be the serial killer. But first, let me tell you about the solved case that led us to Jack Boken. This cold case was just solved February of 2022. The victim is Michelle Marie Veal. She was a mom to three young daughters, and on July of 1996, on the date of actually Michelle's youngest daughter's birthday, her nude limp body was found dumped along a barbed wire fence on a rural road in Santa Rosa, California, and she is thought to have been linked to the hitchhiker murders. Michelle Marie Veal of Union City had been beaten to death with multiple skull fractures and a broken neck. They were able to get the DNA of the killer because Michelle had been a fighter and DNA was left under her fingertips. Armed with only a small amount of DNA, after 25 long years, they sent it off to the lab. They would soon learn that her killer had actually been in the FBI CODIS database for years. Jack Alexander Boken, who was serving a 231-year sentence for a series of serial rapes, was the killer. And he had just passed away in prison December of 2021. He missed those charges by two months. As I researched, I learned how truly evil Boken truly was. Jack Alexander Boken Jr. was born on March 20th, 1943 in San Francisco. Two parents, Jack Sr. and Evelyn Boken. He was an only child. He came from a decent, hardworking, middle-class family. His parents owned a hardware store and were open six days a week, so they worked quite a bit. Jack was embarrassed that his family was considered middle-class, blue-collar workers, and refused to call them mommy and daddy, and was always very insistent on calling them mother and father. He would bitterly complain that they were never his social or intellectual equals, and that their lack of refinement had been the cause of all his problems. He was known to be a brilliant student and excelled in math and science. He was a piano prodigy. He just had a natural ability to reproduce the most complex classical works by ear. 
I think that would be so amazing to have musical ability like that. That reminds me, one of my subscribers said I sounded like Dolly Parton, and I said, Honey, I wish I could sing like Dolly Parton. No, you don't want to hear me sing on here. Trust me. I'll just stick to telling stories. He excelled at chess, made his own telescope, and became a bodybuilder. Remember that. He's a strong guy. He, he even aspired to be an astrophysicist. Why is that so hard to say? Astrophysicist. You guys know what I'm saying, right? But he seemed to have an evil side that he kept secret, even taking some of his secrets to the grave. At seven years of age, he snuck his dad's handgun to school. At nine, he started stealing bikes and selling the parts. It escalated quickly because at 10 years of age, he started raping his three-year-old cousin. Three years old. Horrible. He would sneak his cousin into his bedroom, basement, or even on his parents' roof in order to molest the little girl. He was only 10. How did he even know this stuff? I don't even want to know. In school, he didn't even have any friends. His classmates thought that he was very odd. The entire family praised Jack as a good boy who didn't waste time on girls, cars, and teenage mischief. He always had a good excuse for when he was in trouble and since he is known as the good boy, his family often accepted his lies. When Jack was 16, he broke into the electronic shop next door to his parents' hardware store by crawling through the connecting false ceilings. He told his parents he had been making some repairs to the wiring. <laughs> He'd been making some repairs to the wiring. I was just being friendly that day and I decided to I'm in their attic and help them out. Just don't worry about the TV I have in my hands. Mm, nothing. When he was 18, he burglarized a parked car and was arrested for the first time. Guess what? He told his parents that he was merely standing next to the car and that the police officers were lying. December 1964, when he was 21, Jack assaulted a 30-year-old woman on the University of California Berkeley Extension Campus in San Francisco. He decided to disable her car while she was in class and then casually walked by and offered to help her start it. Once inside the car, he wrapped a shoelace around her throat and threatened to choke her if she made any noise. Well... Genius, it's kind of hard to make noise with a shoelace around your throat. Then he made her strip to the waist and ordered her to remain quiet. This is weird. While well, he spent two hours kissing and fondling her breast. She later identified him and he was arrested. The court found Jack to be mentally disordered sex offender. He spent the next two years in a state psychiatric hospital. Of course, he told his parents that the police had intentionally misrepresented what actually was an innocent, clumsy social encounter. I'm not sure how fondling a woman for two hours is an innocent social encounter, so I would think his parents had to have some doubts, or they were just super naive. I don't know which. When he spent time in the psychiatric hospital, he did admit to three other past assaults. And he wrote while at the hospital that he was glad he learned his lesson at a young age so that he won't have to make the mistakes that other people do. After his release from the mental hospital, Jack got his contractor's license starting his own plumbing business and bought a house a few blocks from his parents' home. And in 1968, married a woman named Nancy, whose family owned a bookstore right across the street from his parents' hardware store. His contracting and plumbing business never seemed to bring in enough cash to satisfy him. He desperately wanted to appear wealthy, of course, and successful. This led him to a path of crime. Between 1970 and 1990, he 
he would be convicted six times on burglary and stolen property charges and served five separate prison terms during that time. Nancy stuck by Jack through three incarcerations. The fourth one, I guess, was a little much for her because she then divorced him, taking their young daughter with her. A few months, he had met Cheryl, a 36-year-old elementary teacher. He liked her because she had a secure job and a steady income. But what was even better than that is she had a trust fund and wealthy parents. Mm, that beat it all. So they married in June of 1982. And within five months, they had their first child, a daughter, and they lived happily ever after. Not. You, you knew that wasn't true on a true crime show. In 1991, Jack began pressuring his parents to mortgage their home and loan him a large sum of money. His father was willing, but his mother refused. Mm, mother's figuring out what kind of boy he is, sounds like to me. Mother is smartening up. Jack was livid. Not long after his mother was sent to a care home, and although the nurse reported she was fine on last check, she was mysteriously found dead about an hour later. Jack had been known to sneak into the care home in order to see his mother. You know where I'm going here, don't you? Within days after his mother's death, he had convinced his grieving father to give him the money he had been asking for. Miracle. In 1993, a woman named Marion became a secretary for Jack in his home office, home office. Although still married to Cheryl, at this time he began having an affair with Marion. Shocker! At times, having sex in the master bedroom while his wife was at work and his children were in school. Marion was a heroin addict and one night actually came to Jack's house to try to get money for her drug habit. This made Jack so mad that she would show up at his house with his family home. How dare her! Later, he concocted a plan and he drove Marion out to a deserted area where he kneed Marion in the ribs and placed his hands around her neck. Jack tied Marion's hands behind her back with a pantyhose and grabbed and hit her repeatedly. This is kind of weird. He sucked and chewed on her tongue, chewed on her tongue, and then orally raped her. Then he choked her until she lost consciousness. Marion's injuries would later show that Jack's final act was to push her unconscious out of his car as he drove away. By 7th, 1996, Cheryl and the kids went to visit her parents. After his wife had left, Jack thought, I'm going to go pick up a prostitute named Jamie. He drove to a house on Bryant Street where he held her there for 16 hours while he repeatedly raped her over and over, mostly involving oral rape. An epileptic, Janie lost consciousness several times and at one point awoke to find a champagne bottle stuffed, well, where the sun don't shine. I'm trying to be careful here. The man made her shower while he washed her and called her dirty, dirty. <sniffs> and then he forced her to let him watch while she used the bathroom, after which he wanted to wipe her himself. Janie was afraid to report the assault because she had an open warrant and didn't want to go to jail. On January 22nd, 1997, a 34-year-old prostitute named Martha walked into the Mission Police Station and reported she had been picked up that morning by a man who held and assaulted her for over eight hours in a house on Bright Street. The man tied her arms and legs and repeatedly sucked and chewed on her tongue and sexually assaulted her. She lost track of how many times she'd been orally raped. She finally escaped after attacking him with a pair of scissors. Police went to the address Martha provided and arrested Jack, who still bore the scratches from the scissor attack. On October 4th, 1997, Jack was still out on bail waiting trial on these assault cases. At approximately 5.30, a 19-year-old prostitute named Amber was picked up 
by Jack. But he told her his name was Jimmy, and he said he worked for the government. He drove her to a remote area off Bayshore Boulevard, where he bound her hands behind her. He repeatedly beat and raped her. And you know the oral thing. He did that weird suck and chewed on her tongue. And she said it was like a dog chewing on a piece of meat and bit her in other areas of her body while she shrieked in pain. He warned her he had a relative in the San Francisco Police Department who would protect him as she tried to report him. It only gets stranger from here. Jack beat her, and then he called her a crybaby. Then he held her in his arms, wiped her eyes, and apologized for hurting her. He told her he loved her and ask if she liked him and would go out with him again. She said, I told him I'd go out with him again now that I knew what he wanted. At that point, I was going to tell him anything he wanted to hear. That's a smart girl. She also said, my hands were numb from being tied behind me for so long. I told him that if he had untied me, that I'd give him a really good, you know, Jack told Amber to get out of the car so he could untie her hands. Then when she got out of the car, he grabbed her by her hair, jerked her head down to her knees, and began hitting her in the head with an object she thought was a hammer. She could hear her skull cracking like an eggshell. Oh, wow. She fell to the ground and lay motionless hoping he would think that she was dead and stop hitting her. She rolled back her eyes and forced herself to remain limp as he lifted her up by her hair and threw her right into his trunk. He drove a short distance, then stopped to stuff her into plastic garbage bags, guys. And then he covered everything, head and everything, inside garbage bags. She's fully alive and stuffed her back into the trunk. He resumed driving. You won't believe this, but she managed to free her hands and bite an air hole in the back. That's the only reason she lived. Convinced she was going to die, she wiped blood from her head wounds on the inside of the car trunk so that someone would know she had been there. But then she became afraid that he might open the trunk and see the blood and realize that she wasn't dead. So she just wiped that blood back off. Jack drove to a car wash where he vacuumed the car and sprayed water inside the trunk. Then he drove off again. Amber felt around in the darkness for something she could use to open the trunk. She said she heard there was a way to pop open car trunks from the inside. She found some sort of a tool and used it to bang on the trunk latch, but it remained locked. At some point, Amber felt the car go into reverse and then stop. How terrifying is that? Jack opened the trunk and this time he gently lifted her out and cradled her tenderly for a few moments like you would hold your child. Then he tipped her out of his arms. She fell for a second or two and then landed in water. Basically, he threw her over an embankment into a creek below. Amber waited until she saw his car taillights disappear. Then she wriggled free of her bindings and the plastic bag and swam through the darkness to a small dock. Weak, exhausted, and numb with cold. She paddled around the dock for several minutes before she found a way to pull herself up and onto the dock. Then she climbed a low wall and walked along the top, stepping sideways and clinging to a barbed wire fence. Naked except for a pair of socks and dazed from open skull fractures and loss of blood. She stumbled out into traffic. A woman in a passing car stopped and called 911. 
At the hospital over the next few days, officers showed Amber photographs of possible suspects. Jack was very well known to officers, but initially he didn't come to mind as a suspect, so when they brought pictures of her on the first two groups, he was not included in those pictures. After she couldn't find anybody, then they added the third group with Jack in it. And so Amber looked through those photos and suddenly she just screamed and just threw the book across the bed. Well, they knew instantly it was Jack. So the FBI then staked out Jack's Bryant Street home and arrested him on October 11th for attempted murder, kidnap, rape, and false imprisonment. Among other charges, this time he was held without bail. Jack's trial began August 3rd, 1999. During the trial, Jack was able to get hold of a copy of his handcuff keys. I guess one of the prisoners had been making copy of the keys and he got one. And during the trial, while the court case was going on, he was able to he put it in his mouth. He was able to unlock his cuffs, and he just took off running right out of the courtroom. Was able to make it to the stairway where deputies tackled him and threw him down. And that sucker then went to jail, you knew, for 231 years. This is where we discuss Jack Boken's connection to the Hitchhiker murders. You're going to find out, and you're going to see there's so many similar things about these cases that it has to be him in 1972 around seven women would go missing or found murdered around the santa rosa area and you knew that jack lived around that area all were last seen hitchhiking we're just going to do a quick rundown on their bodies and how they were found just because we're looking at evidence I want to do someday, I want to go into the victims and do that side of it. I'm not leaving the victims out in any way. I'm just looking at the evidence here, okay? The first two girls were Maureen Lewis Sterling, who was 12 years old, and Yvonne Lisa Weber, who was 13. Their bodies were found on December 28, 1972. Two and a half miles north of Porter Creek Road on Frank Valley Road, down a steep embankment approximately 66 feet off the east side of the roadway. A single earring, orange beads, and a 14 karat gold necklace with cross were found at the scene. The cause of death could not be determined because they had been a while, they'd been out there a while, so it was just skeletal remains. Sterling's mother did identify the cross necklace, but she only received one earring back. One of the earrings was not there. So our third victim on March 5th, 1972, 19-year-old Kim Wendy Allen. New body was found by two boys on a hilly stretch of road in Santa Rosa, down an embankment in a creek beside the road. Autopsies determined that Allen died from asphyxiation by being slowly strangled by a cord or rope around her neck. This is horrible, y'all. I don't know if you've heard this before. But she died a long, torturous death by being strangled slowly for at least 30 minutes before she died. It was said that the killer would strangle her till she lost unconsciousness. Then let her come back. Strangle her, do that over and over again, each time her losing unconsciousness. Till finally, she passed away. Imagine that'd be horrible to wake up and know he's gonna have another round of that. Allen was killed and dumped down an embankment about 24 hours before the two boys had found her body. There was also evidence Allen had been raped and she was nude and had been bound at the ankles and wrist. Also, a single gold hoop earring was found at the site. So, one earring was still missing again. The next victim that was connected to the Santa Rosa murders was 
Lori Lee Cursa, 13. Her frozen remains were located on December 14, 1972, in a ravine. The killer had thrown the body at least 30 feet over an embankment. The girl had a single wire loop in each earlobe, but the rest of the earrings were missing and were not found at the scene. So basically, the jewels part, like these jewels part, were not there in the earrings. The cause of her death was a broken neck with compressions and hemorrhage of the spinal cord. If you remember, uh, Michelle Veal had a broken neck as well. It is noted that she did not immediately die after being thrown into the ravine, but she could not move because her neck had been broken. So she laid there, exposed to the cold weather, and that's what killed her was that exposure. Mm. Horrible. The victim, they didn't see any signs of rape, and they thought she probably died probably one to two weeks before her body was discovered. Okay, let's go back to Amber, the victim who survived in 1997 and led to the arrest and conviction of Jack. Amber had similar occurrences to each of these girls. Remember, Amber was thrown in an embankment just like these other victims. Embankment usually involved water. All the victims were found nude in rural areas. Not only nude, but he had also possibly took their clothes as a trophy and also a piece of jewelry as a trophy. I looked all over, I researched all over to see if Amber had had any jewelry taken or Michelle. I did not find either of those things. Maybe something you might could research and see if you can find that, but I couldn't find it in my research. Some of the victims had a broken neck, maybe, possibly, maybe due to being tossed over the embankment or could be when he strangled them could have caused that. The victims were all known to be hogtied and strangled. The cold case that was just solved the one that Jack Boken, we know for sure, did. She had the broken neck. I, we discussed that earlier, and she was strangled. I was just bringing the stories of our victims in the 90s back into the stories of the victims in the 70s so we could see how similar they were. Um, if you remembered, he was married to Nancy in the 70s, and that's when his crimes escalated like the burglary. Maybe this part of his crimes escalated during that time as well. Now, where was he from the 70s to 90s? Is There could be tons of other bodies out there. I know there's at least 66 more unsolved homicides in that area during that time. And so, who knows? I don't know if I mentioned Michelle and Amber was also nude. Now, this brings us to Carolyn Nadine Davis, 15. Her body was discovered on July 31st, 1973 in Santa Rosa, just three feet from where the remains of Sterling and Weber's bodies have been found. And that was like seven months prior to this one. Her death was a little bit different. It was strychnine poisoning. She was given it probably 10 to 14 days before the discovery. It could not be determined whether poison had been administered by needle or by peel. A pathologist determined her probable date of death was July 20th, 1973, five days after her grandmother had last seen her. It could not be determined if she'd been raped. I was thinking that if they had been orally raped, then there might not be any evidence of rape. Also, an autopsy found that Davis had an injury to her right earlobe that appeared to be an attempted ear piercing. Her left earlobe had not been pierced. He only tried to pierce one earlobe. Maybe he was mad because this victim did not have an earrings. And it looked like as her body had been thrown you know, from the road, down, just like the others, down into the water. There was two other bodies that were very similar to this one. Put their pictures on the screen. Also, it said that 
the killer would have had to been strong to be able to throw the bodies like he did. Plus, there was some that he walked a little ways carrying their bodies before he dumped them. And it made me think, oh, Jack was a bodybuilder. That makes sense. He would be well able to carry those bodies. Also, I thought something that was weird was that all the known victims' deaths occurred around July and December, it looked like to me. I do know that Jack was a plumber. I don't know if those months are less busy for plumbers. I wouldn't think so because in California, I thought that December is y'all's wettest month, so I think plumbers would work more. But hey, if there's a plumber out there from California, leave a comment. Maybe we can try to figure that one out. If you guys can think of any more weird ties, if you happen to research it, then hey, stick in the comments your ideas, your thoughts of this case. I'm ready to get that DNA back just to see how many murders that this guy could be tied to. Um, and if he was the hitchhiker serial killer, it would solve a lot of girls' deaths. If the family has some kind of answers of who did this to these girls, that'd be amazing. Um, so I'm ready to see what happens in that case. All right, y'all have a great week. Be safe out there. Be blessed. And thank you for being so supportive of me and my channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are always so kind. Well, see y'all later. Bye. Love y'all.